third lecture around the inverse Galois problem. Thank you. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me let me recall what, uh, where we are. So in the first lecture, we talked about the, the quotient uh, a n mod g. <coughs> and I've explained that when this is rational, you get a positive solution to, to the inverse Galois problem. But I've also explained that this is not always rational. So then in the second lecture, we, we discussed the rigidity method, which is um, another way to apply Hilbert's irreducibility theorem to construct uh, extensions with given Galois group. Um, so this applies in many cases, but uh, it's still a limited scope of application. So for example, it doesn't apply to P groups. I mean, it applies to many simple groups, but uh, such things as P groups are generally outside of the scope of the rigidity method. So, okay, and what was what was it about? We were looking for families over P1. So, uh, because of the versality property I mentioned, uh, looking for families over P1 is the same as looking for curves P1 inside of this space. So, if so, if this is not rational, maybe we can find a rational curve in it. And if we cannot find a rational curve in it, then maybe we can find rational points directly. So that will be the, the, the theme of today's uh, lecture. So find uh, interesting rational points in this quotient. Uh, OK, so we actually we're not going to work with this variety. It's slightly more convenient to work with another one that I'm going to introduce now. But it's, it, it will make no difference. Uh, it's just more convenient. So let's fix a finite group G. So recall here, I chose an embedding of G into a symmetric group, and I let it act on AN by permuting the coordinates. Now let me do something slightly different. I embed G into SLN of K. So I work over some field K, so number field. So you embed G into SNN of K uh, in some way. And I mean, <coughs> you can always do this. First embed G into SN, for example, for some N, embed SN into some SNN of K. Uh, and then let's consider G as a subgroup of SNN. So let's consider SNN as an algebraic group over K. So that's an algebraic variety with a group law. And I, I view G as, an, uh, as a subgroup. And I consider the quotient of the group by the subgroup. OK, so if you like, it's the quotient of SNN by the right action of G by multiplication. And why is it better than, than this one? It's Well, because the action is free, so this is smooth. Here you have singularities, so it's, it's more convenient to work with this. So here we have SNN goes to uh, SNN mod G. So this is smooth. Uh, so this is a G torsor. And it turns out to be a versal G torsor, just in the same way that we, we got a versal G torsor with affine space. OK, I emphasize these are varieties over K. So we're going to work with this, and uh, it's really, I mean, constructing rational points here is really the same as constructing rational points there. Uh, I mean, uh, in technical terms, these varieties are stably but rationally equivalent. Uh, this is not so important, and it's explained in the exercises. So let me recall uh, the relationship between the rationality of this quotient and Grunewald's problem. So recall. So, sorry, I, I will go here. So, if SNN mod G is rational, then it satisfies weak approximation.
So I recall weak approximation means that if you are given a finite set of places and local points at these places, you can find a rational point which is as close as you want to these local points at these places. Um, okay, so because it's true for A1, it's easy to deduce it's true for rational varieties. And this, remember, uh, implied a positive solution to Grunewald's problem. Uh, for G over K. For all sets of places S. And just to refresh your memory, so this is asking for the existence of extensions of K with group, group G, Galois group, uh, sorry, Galois extensions of K with group G, whose completions at the places of S are prescribed. And just to uh, re recall how this works. The local prescribed extensions give you uh, KV points on this on this quotient by versatility. Then you approximate them, and uh, in this way you get um, a rational point, which by Ekedal you can assume to have a connected fiber. So this gives you a Galois extension of K with the prescribed completions. Okay, so it's actually. Uh, not uh, difficult to see that this implication is an equivalence. Okay, so that's the situation. And I've, al I've also explained that this fails, for example, for Z mod 8Z uh, uh, over Q. So now, uh, after Bianca's lecture, the natural question is, what is this failure of weak approximation on this variety? Is it a Brahmanian obstruction? Is this a Brahmanian obstruction? Uh, to weak approximation? And, well, the answer is yes. So to state this, let me introduce some, some notation. Um, so unfortunately, I, I, can, I cannot use the same notation as Bianca did because her varieties were proper, but these are not proper varieties, and I, I don't want to introduce smooth compactifications. So let me introduce slightly different notation, but it's the same thing. Uh, so I will so x a, a variety. I will denote by x uh, of k omega the product of the local places. Uh, sorry, the product of the local points. Product of x of kv. So this is exactly what Bianca considered, except she wrote x of ak, the adelic points. It's the same when x is proper. OK, and uh, so then she considered the uh, Brommer group. And here, the same. It's not the Brouwer group of X, which is going to be interesting, but the Brouwer group of a smooth projective variety by Russian equivalent to X. So this is the uh, so-called uh, unramified Brouwer group, denoted Brouwer NR. So th this is going to be the Brouwer group of any smooth uh, proper variety containing X. Uh, any smooth proper variety containing X as an open subset. So it's a non-trivial fact, but it's true that it does not depend on the variety you choose. It really only depends on X. OK. And so then Bianca explained how you uh, that you have the uh, Brahman in set. So, uh, th yes? No, no, no. <laughs> yes, you can, but I mean, we're in characteristic zero anyway. Yeah. <laughs> if you're in characteristic, sorry, if you're in characteristic P, you can do other things, but you have to be careful with um, the P primary torsion subgroup where P is the characteristic. 
So basically, if you look only at what's prime to p, you can do as you say. Um, OK, so recall. Uh, we have these inclusions. Uh, the rational points contained in the Brahman in set x of k omega. Uh, ah. Exponents bra unramified. Uh, contained in x of k omega. Okay, and so recall this is closed. So the closure of the rational points in the uh, set of uh, collections of local points has to be contained in there. And so if this inclusion on the right is strict, then weak approximation cannot hold. This is a Brahmanian obstruction to weak approximation. And so the question here is uh, take x equal Sn and mod g. Uh, is this inclusion strict or is it not? So the answer is yes. And more generally, here's the theorem. And uh, please don't hesitate to ask any question you might have. And, and let me know, because I, I can't see you. <laughs> um, so here's theorem 0. So this is due, I think, to uh, Voskresensky and Sansuk. Um, <coughs> so you take x equal SNN mod g. So we are working over a field, uh, a, no a number field. So over k, a number field. And g is a finite abelian group. OK, uh, then the rational points are dense in the Brahmanian set. So this is a situation where the Brahmanian obstruction contr controls everything. Uh, you, can uh, you can do weak approximation of a collection of local points as soon as they satisfy the Brahmanian conditions. So this doesn't directly tell you that you have a Brahmanian obstruction, but because you know that weak approximation fails, and because you have this density, the only possibility is that there is a Brahmanian obstruction. OK, so uh, marginally, we, we hope that uh, such a, a density statement is, is true in much greater generality. So Bianca alluded to the case of geometrically rational surfaces. So let me state the general conjecture. Conjecture one. So due to Colliot Delen, So this should work for so-called rationally connected varieties. So k is a number field for the, all the lecture. I will not repeat it. So x is smooth, rationally connected which I will abbreviate by RC uh, variety of a k. Then the, the, the same density statement should hold. Is then so. In other words, the Brahmanian obstruction tells you w about the existence and weak approximation of rational points. So, okay, what is rationally connected? So, uh, <coughs> it's a purely geometric notion. So you can extend the scalars to to the complex numbers if you like. Uh, so x rationally connected. So let's say you embed k into c. So this means 
uh, that if you take two general points, you can connect them by a rational curve over C. Two general uh, C points uh, can be connected uh, by a rational curve over C. A rational curve, the image of a P1, some open in P1. So, for example, if X is geometrically rational, uh, that's true because if it's geometrically rational, uh, an open will be an open in, in PN, and in PN you can use lines to connect two points. So that's very easy. But the, the, this notion is <coughs> much better behaved than rationality. Um, and so, for example, also our uh, SNN mod G is rationally connected uh, because it's unirational. Uh, so, unirational means it's dominated by a rational variety, and SLN itself is rational. And again, if you have a two complex points, you can lift them, and because it's rational, use lines in the projective space to connect them. Okay. Okay, so this conjecture, as Bianca mentioned, is very much open even for surfaces. Um, <laughs> but still, there are some significant positive results. So just to give an example, uh, so let me say that this is known to be true. Uh, so that's a theorem of Borovoy. True if X is a homogeneous space. Uh, of a of a linear group, sorry, linear algebraic group, with connected stabilizers. So what does this mean? Uh, so you have a linear algebraic group which is acting on your variety, and homogeneous space means that the action is transitive on the k-bar points. Uh, and okay, and so but you require that the connect the stabilizers be connected. So, for example, SNN mod G is a homogeneous space of SLN. SNN acts on the left, but the stabilizers they are isomorphic to G, which is a finite group. It's not connected at all, so it doesn't apply to this. Okay, but this is still quite a large uh, class of varieties. So uh, let's come back to our motivation. So this conjecture is directly related to Grunewald's problem uh, because of uh, the same situation as uh, in the first lecture. So namely, I, there's this theorem of Ikedal. which is telling us that uh, the Hil Hilbert irreducibility theorem is true not only over uh, P1 or uh, rational varieties, but also over uh, rationally connected varieties that satisfy the conjecture. So uh, let me state it like this. Take a connected G torso then if you if you look uh, sorry an X is a, is a smooth rationally connected variety satisfying conjecture one satisfying uh, conjecture one then not only can you find rational points approximation approximating any s any point in the Brahmanian set but you can even find one such that the fiber of pi is connected so if you take the set of rational points such that the fiber of pi is connected, then even this is still dense in the Brahmanian set.
Uh, sorry, ah, k omega uh, bar and ramified x. Okay. Okay, so what does this tell us? Um, well, it tells us that if you want to, to, to solve Grunewald's problem, what you really have to do is to prove this conjecture for SNN mod G and then understand uh, the Brahmanian abstraction. So, consequence. Uh, if you have conjecture one for SNN mod G, and you can compute the Brahmanian set, then you, you get a complete answer to Grunewald's problem for G over K. Uh, you get a complete answer to Grunewald's problem. Again, because your local prescribed extensions give you local points here, and then the, the only question you have is, can you complete this uh, collection of local points at the other places in such a way that the resulting family is in the Brahmanian set. If you can do it, then you, so then you have a positive answer, and otherwise you don't. So in a sense, uh, uh, theorem zero in, in this way is a reformulation of the grunewald wang theorem that tells the complete answer to Grunewald's problem for a billion groups. Uh, it's a much cleaner statement. Uh, but on the other hand, you still have to compute the Brahmanian sets. And I mean, that's where, where the, the part which is not so clean uh, goes. Uh, in, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's the in, in, the compu in the computation of this set for uh, in this case. But it can be done. It, and in this way, you can recover the statement of the Grunewald uh, Wang theorem. So uh, in practice, if you have another group and you, and you know the conjecture, um, well, you still have to compute the, this Brahmanian set. And as Bianca explained, this can be hard. Uh, so, uh, well, the first thing you would do is to compute the Brouwer group, the unramified Brouwer group here. And, well, in general, this is hard. For this variety, SNN mod G, <coughs> at least we have formula uh, that we can try to apply. So there's the, uh, uh, the, the, the part of the Brouwer group that survives over K bar for which there is a formula due to Bogomolov, and there is the algebraic part of the Brouwer group, the, the part which dies over k-bar, for which there is another formula due to, uh, due to Harari. Um, so in practice, usually you, you can use them to compute the unramified Brouwer group in this case. Um, still, this doesn't tell you what the Brahmanian set is. So <laughs> uh, this formula only gives you the structure of the group to compute the Brahmanian set, you need representatives, and that's not so that's not so easy. But still, in some cases, it gives you the answer. For example, it can it can be that you find that the bar group uh, here is just reduced to the constant classes. So then there is no Brahmanian abstraction at all, and and then you have a complete positive answer to Grunewald's problem without excluding any place. Um, so, so this happens. So there's an example like this uh, in the exercises. So where you apply the two formula, and 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 you find this conclusion. So uh, in, in the lecture, the only thing I will say is uh, there's a one general fact that uh, gives you uh, s some information about Grunewald's problem starting from this. Uh, it's a theorem due to Lucchini Arteche theorem. Sorry. Uh, yeah, which says, if you have conjecture 1 for SNN mod G, then <coughs> you have um, a positive solution to Grunewald's problem for G as soon as you avoid uh, the places that divide the order of G. Positive solution. to Grunewald's problem uh, 
uh, for G uh, for any uh, S that does not contain places dividing the order of G. So this is the hope that I uh, formulated at the beginning of the first lecture. But we hope that this is always true. Uh, so th this is the explanation why. <coughs> so the proof of this theorem is really a study of the evaluation of the classes in the Brauer group of such a space at the local points. And well, he proves that nothing happens at the places that don't divide the order of G. OK. Um, so uh, the theorem that I wanted to state uh, in, in this lecture is a uh, positive result for uh, conjecture one. Uh, sorry, so this was theorem three. Ah, this was theorem two. And this is theorem four. So which I proved with Jonathan Harpas. which is that conjecture one holds uh, for SNN mod G if G is nilpotent or uh, even super solvable. Uh, if G is, uh, say, super solvable. So let me remind you what this is. So super solvable is in between nilpotent and, so and solvable. It means uh, there is a filtration, uh, G equals uh, G1, G2, uh, and so on, Gn, uh, such that each Gi is normal in G, and the quotients are cyclic, uh, normal in G, and the Gi uh, mod Gi plus 1 uh, are cyclic. Okay. So this includes uh, nilpotent groups, so all p groups, for example. And so, as I've explained, this gives a positive answer to Grunwald's problem, at least at the places uh, if you if you exclude these places, the places that divide the order of G. And in theory, uh, if you are able to compute the Brahmanian obstruction, uh, you can get more precise answers. Right, so um, in a sense, this is the best approxim approximation you can get to the uh, hilbert nutter method. I mean, they wanted to uh, construct rational points on A n mod g or S n n mod g, uh, well, by, by requiring that this be rational. Okay, it's not rational, but ca you can still construct uh, enough rational points uh, to, to, to make the method work, in a sense. So, um, OK, is there any question about this? OK, if there's none, so now what I will try to, to do is to explain um, what I mean, how you would go about proving such things, uh, what type of tools you can use. Um, so, uh, and that's what I will do in the remainder of this talk. So, um, okay. Uh, so, the main tool, uh, one, well, one, one of the main tools is uh, so called descent theory. So, I will try to explain this. So, for this, I need to introduce. Uh, the notion of torsos in a slightly more general situation. So let X be a smooth variety. And uh, G, an algebraic group. I'm not assuming that it's a finite group anymore. Uh, an algebraic group of a K. So it could be a finite group. But it need not be. Okay, and k is a field of characteristic zero. So a G torsor over X Oh 
Well, the, the definition is essentially the same as I gave for finite groups. So uh, is a smooth surjective map uh, pi from y to x. So y is some variety over g. Smooth is telling you that the fibers are smooth. And an action of g on y, such that this is equivariant, So such that this is equivalent, and such that G acts simply transitively on the fibers at the level of k bar points. Phi is G equivalent. So again, here the action of G on X is trivial. So I really mean that it's invariant if you precompose by the action of G. Uh, and G of k bar. acts simply transitively uh, on the fibers of uh, y, y of k bar goes to x of k bar. OK. So um, when you have this, in particular, x is, a qu is the quotient of y by j, by g, sorry. So the notion of torsor uh, like this for uh, algebraic groups is very convenient, for example, for stating uh, the Hilbert 90 theorem. So example, so Hilbert 90. So one reformulation of the Hilbert 90 theorem is telling you that, uh, uh, ah, so uh, yeah, that uh, GLN torsos over a field over K are are are, uh, are isomorphic to GLN are trivial. GLN torsos over the points, so over K, and uh, are isomorphic to GLN. And SLN torsos over K. That's also that's a consequence. Are isomorphic to SLN. Okay. I mean, you can just take it for granted. It's reformulation. Right. So next thing I need uh, to talk about descent is the notion of twist. So um, definition. So if you take a, a G torsor over uh, over K like this, and um, sorry, a G, a G torsor over X and a G torsor over K, P. then it makes sense to twist pi by p. And this means the following. So the twist, which we denote by uh, y sub p, but sub on the left. Well, that's just you take the product of y by p, and you mod out by the diagonal action of g. And this still maps to x. I mean, you have the first projection here. And because uh, x is y mod g, you, you still get the map to, to x. Right, so uh, now I have everything I need to state the conjecture of uh, descent for, I mean, in this context. So it doesn't look like it very much, uh, but uh, it's really the same as descent in the context of elliptic curves. It's a generalization. So conjecture five, descent. 
So suppose you have a smooth rationally connected variety over a number field, x. Uh, over number field k. And suppose you have a g, uh, so g some uh, linear group, some uh, over k. Linear algebraic group over k. And suppose you have a g torsor over x. Uh, a g torsor. So the, the conjecture, uh, well, I should maybe call it a hope. Uh, if conjecture one, the rational points are dense in the Brahmanian set, holds for y and for all of its twists, then it holds for x. For all the twists of y, so it means for all p, all g, g torsos over k p like this. You, you no, so this is a slightly subtle point that I was hoping to avoid. So if, if g is a billion, then yes, they are still g torsos. Otherwise, they are torsos under uh, an inner form of g. But uh, here I'm not using this this fact anyway. I'm just looking at them as varieties. Okay, so if conjecture one holds for all of the twists of y, then it holds for x. So this is a way to descend conjecture one. I mean, it can happen, and that's what happens in, in many situations, that you have your variety x, and you are able to produce some g torsor over, over x, whose geometry is simpler, and whose arithmetic is simpler, and maybe you can actually solve conjecture one for y, and for all of its twists, and then you're done. So it's not clear at all a priori why such a thing should be useful, but in practice, it turns out to be. Okay, so um, uh, okay, so here's a theorem about uh, descent, which is due to Coulotelen, Sansuk, Arpaz, and myself. is that this uh, descent procedure, the conjecture 5, holds is true if g uh, is a torus. Is true uh, if g is a torus. So let me recall what the torus is. So it's a commutative algebraic group. Uh, so torus means it's a commutative algebraic group which geometrically over k bar uh, is um, uh, isomorphic to a product of gm, gm cross gm cross gm cross gm. Or if you like, it's uh, the group of uh, homomorphisms from a lattice uh, L to gm. Okay, L is uh, z to the power n, but maybe there's some Galois action on it. Okay, so um, with this, let me show you how using this uh, you can prove uh, theorem zero. So, a sketch of proof of theorem zero. So recall theorem zero says that uh, conjecture one, the, the density of rational points in the Brahmanian set, is true for SLN mod G when G is finite a billion. Okay, so this is just a sketch. Um, so first there's a, a fact which is uh, not e obvious, but it's not difficult, and it's, in, it's in an exercise in the uh, list of exercises. So let, let's just take this for granted. Fact that there is an, you can find an exact sequence 
of uh, commutative groups over k, there exists an exact sequence uh, 1, g, uh, t, q, 1, where t is a torus over k, and q is also a torus uh, of, a, of a special kind. So where q, t are tori over k. And, ah, sorry, I have to go there. And q is a so-called quasi-trivial torus. Sorry, and q is quasi-trivial. So what does that mean? Uh, well, it means that if you write q geometrically as hum of a lattice to gm, uh, there is a basis of the lattice which is stable under the action of Galois. Uh, so that means really q over k bar uh, is hum of some permutation module to gm. So for example, GM is quasi-trivial. The product of GMs is quasi-trivial. Their restrictions are quasi-trivial. OK, let me not insist on this. I will just tell you why it's useful, just for two things, uh, quasi-triviality. Well, first, it implies that Q is rational. It's uh, just like GM is rational. And also, uh, Q torsors over K, over a field, are isomorphic to Q over a field are isomorphic to Q. And this is, again, Hilbert's theorem 90 in uh, yet another guise. OK. So all of this, if you like, is an exercise. We take it for granted. It's, uh, it's rather formal. And let me explain how, using this, you, you can prove this uh, statement for SNN and mod G. I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, it's the two of them. I mean, you need Shapiro to get to, to GM, and then you apply Hilbert 90 for GM. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so, OK. So here's what you do. You have SLN mod G. And you consider SLN. So we've embedded our abelian group in, in, into this torus T. So that takes the product with T. And let me take the quotient by G, by the diagonal action. OK, so I claim, well, the first projection induces a map here. And now, if you think about it, of course, T acts on this by multiplication on, on, the, on this factor on the left, right? You, you model on the right, but there's still an action on the left. And it's obvious that it's going to act simply transitively on the fibers. So this is a torsor. This is a t-torsor. OK, so here's our t-torsor, and we're going to apply descent to it. So theorem 6 tells us we can do it if you want to prove conjecture 1. Uh, for this variety, it's enough to prove it for this one and all of its twists. So apply descent to this. OK. OK, but then why should it be easier for the top space, the top variety? OK, so to understand this better, let's look at the second projection. SLN cross T goes to T. So I modded by G. So this goes to T mod G, which is Q. But now, for the very same reason, this is an SLN torsor. You still have an action of SLN on this, on the left. And it's clear that SLN is going to act simply transitively on the fibers here. SLN torsor. OK, but now, here's the geometry. It's very simple. We have this base, which is Q. And Q is a quasi-trivial torus. In particular, it's rational. 
And here we have this SLN torsor. And okay, let's look at the generic fiber. It's a SLN torsor over the function field of Q. And by Hilbert 90, this is SLN itself. So there are rational points in it, which tells us there are rational sections here. Rational sections. So all in all, this top space is birationally equivalent to Q times SLN. So it's rational. SLN uh, cross T mod G is rational. And so it satisfies weak approximation and conjecture one for obvious reasons. Satisfies uh, conjecture one. OK, so you still need to, to, to look at the twist, not just this. But if you look at the twist, take a, a t torsor, uh, say p over spec k, a t torsor. If you twist this by p, you will get the same with p instead of t here. Uh, so maybe I just replace it. And then everything else is the same. You sti still get a projection to P mod G. So P mod G is not Q a priori. It's just a Q torsor. But Q torsors are Q. So in fact, you get Q. And then exactly the same argument applies. So that's how you, you do it. So uh, OK. So you see, uh, it's, a, it's a typical example where we don't have like this a natural torsor uh, to which to apply descent. Uh, but it turns out that you can construct one in some way, then apply descent to reduce yourself to another variety whose geometry is simpler. So um, OK. So here's the uh, actual theorem that is behind the theorem I stated on uh, super solvable groups. So uh, theorem 7. Um, so uh, which we proved with Jonathan Arpas. Uh, so in fact, it's uh, that the descent uh, method uh, is true, not just when G is a, tor a torus, but also when it's a finite super solvable group. Conjecture 5 uh, is true if G is a, a finite super solvable group. Um, so this is what we call a super solvable descent. So I'm sorry, I just erased the statement of conjecture 5. So let me just repeat it. You start with a torsor over a rationally connected variety, um, a, a, a G torsor, where G is a finite super solvable group. If rational points are dense in the Brahmanian sets for the top space and all of its twists, then the same holds for X. And it's very easy to see that theorem 7 implies uh, the conjecture for SLN mod uh, G. So this implies. This was theorem uh, four, I think. Yeah. You just apply it to this torso. SLN goes to SLN mod G. Um, yeah, so this is a G torso. But the top space is rational. Uh, so it obviously, it satisfies the conjecture. And the twists, well, they are as exactly as, in this, uh, uh, exactly as here. If you, if you twist, you still have the action of SLN on the other side. And uh, the twists are SLN also, so they are SLN. So the twists are isomorphic to SLN. So they are rational. So I, I'm, I will not. Uh, I will not say much about the proof of this. I will just 
I, I just want to say that the basic idea starts exactly like this. So in fact, um, so now G is a super solvable group, so we are not going to embed it into a torus, but okay, we have this filtration with cyclic quotients. You take the, the first quotient and you embed it into, and you apply this, this fact to it. So you embed it into a torus with quasi-trivial quotients, and then you do this construction, exactly this, uh, except that, uh, so, ah, is there color? No. So, okay, so I'm just going to be right here. Um, except that here, of course, uh, because you're looking at uh, the quotient, so now this is, is going to be, um, sorry, so I, we had this g equals g, uh, sorry, g0, I forget, g0, no, g1, I forget what I wrote, g2, and so on. Um, so um, we embed uh, g mod g2, uh, which is cyclic into a torus. Um, and so here we look at SLN mod G2. Yeah. Uh, so a priori cro okay, cross T. And we mod out by the uh, action of uh, G mod G1 or G, if you like. So, and then you, you, you have the same diagram uh, and you apply Descent for, for torsos and tori on the left. The only thing is then the analysis of the arithmetic of the top space is more complicated, it's not just rational. But uh, you still get an action of SLN on the left, but it's not anymore a torsor under SLN. It becomes uh, a homogeneous space, and the stabilizers are G2. So at least you've gained something. The stabilizers are smaller than what you had at the beginning. It's not G, now it's G2. But that's how the proof starts. Then you have to study the arithmetic of this vibration and uh, work inductively. So I don't want to, to talk more about this. Okay, not. Uh, instead, I just want to um, point out that uh, super solvable descent is actually quite more general than just this fact, and so you can apply it to other variants of the uh, inverse Galois problem. Let me just give one example. Um. Um, so. Uh, uh, so theorem seven has other applications. Uh, so for example, so it's a it's somewhat of an anecdotal statement, but it's, it's, I mean, it's a challenge to prove it. So, uh, so here's the theorem. So G, a finite super solvable group. solvable group, and you fix uh, k and number field, and some elements of k, alpha 1, alpha n in k, k star, then uh, there exists a Galois field extension, capital K of k, Galois with group G, Uh, such that the alpha i's are norms from k. Um, so this is something that had been proved first for a billion groups uh, by uh, Fry, Logren, and Rachel Newton. Um, uh, they proved it by uh, actually doing by counting the number of a billion extensions that do this and found they found a positive number um, but to to do it for a super solvable group uh, well I mean if first you have to find a way to 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 construct Galois extensions with a super solvable, given super solvable Galois group so uh, the only known ways are Shafarovich's proof uh, and this one and as far as I know only this one can give you uh, such a, a statement so how you deduce this from super solvable descent, well, that's one of the exercises. So I encourage you to go to the uh, uh, exercise sessions. OK, so um, we have a bit of time for questions, if you like, and I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention.